The 1992 Los Angeles uprising, the Cambodian genocide, Japanese-American incarceration. What you know isn't always the full story. Our new podcast, Inheriting, about Asian-American and Pacific Islander families, where the past is personal. Korean Americans, we call it sa igu. Did you ever realize when you were a child that you became an orphan? Camp was such a hard time. How do you think you got through it? Listen to Inheriting from LAS Studios and the NPR Network, wherever you get your podcasts. You're listening to Whoa! Hot luck. Hot luck. And hey everyone, welcome to Books and Boba, a book club and podcast featuring books by Asian and Asian American authors. My name is Marvin Yue. And I'm Rira Yu. And we are here today for our July 2024 mid-month book news check-in, um, where we go over the latest Asian American related book and publishing news. As always, Books and Boba is supported in part by our listeners um, through our Patreon at patreon.com slash books and boba. So if you would like to become a bigger part of our book club, uh, please head on over. Um, our Patreon supporters can get access to our members-only Discord server, um, where you can talk to us and other book club members in real time, as well as our monthly bonus podcast, Boba Chats, where on our latest episode, we caught up with our friend Julie too, um, had a great conversation about San Gabriel Valley representation, uh, food allergies, and what we've been watching. So if you're interested in hearing us um, chat with authors in a more casual environment, please consider supporting us on Patreon. We really appreciate it. But with that, let's get into it. Uh, as always, we start off our mid-month book news episodes by going over the latest Asian American publishing announcements uh, curated by Rira um, from Publishers Weekly and other sources around the internet. Um, Rira, what is our first book deal. All right. So our first book deal is Dal Acquired World Rights to Scene, the story of Corky Lee and his photographs of Asian America. And it's by two-time APALA award winner, Julie Leung. And it is a picture book about the late Corky Lee, who is referred to as the undisputed unofficial Asian American photographer laureate. The book will be illustrated by Julia Kuo, and it is in partnership with Corky Lee's estate and May Nye. Publication is set for spring 2027. Yeah, so I never got the chance to meet Corky Lee. Um, he passed away a few years ago. But as someone who has worked in the Asian American space uh, for over a decade, um, he's definitely someone that I've heard a lot about. And his work in documenting um, the Asian American experience and struggles cannot be overlooked. So I'm really glad to see um, his story being preserved this way for the next generation. Uh, yeah, I don't really know much about Corky Lee. So uh, this would be a good book for me to read. Uh, just looking at his wiki page, uh, yeah, it sounds like he did a lot for Asian America. And um, he's also a self-taught photographer, which is, you know, really commendable. Yeah, definitely one of the earlier Asian American um, creative professionals that paved the way for um, what we do today. So um, yeah, looking forward to learning more about this book. Congrats to Julie and Julia on the book deal. Okay, next up, Random House Studio acquired road rights to The Big Jump by Marie Tang and illustrated by Jillian Ailey O'Mara. This rite of passage book follows two siblings as they embark on a summer tradition, navigating excitement, nerves, and unexpected challenges along the way. Publication is planned for summer 2027. So not much to go on from uh, the premise, but uh, two siblings and summer traditions. You and I both have siblings. Um, do you have any like summer traditions that you grew up with? I mean, I guess growing up, um, we spent a lot of our summers in Taiwan. So I guess that was our tradition. Yeah, that's true. I mean, a lot of people uh, go back to the motherland during the summer. Um, I didn't go back to Korea that often, but I feel like my parents would put us in like summer programs, whether it's like Korean school or like extra math classes or something. Summer vacation was never really vacation for <laughs> us. Yeah, well, if the title is anything to go by, I imagine jumping over something is going to be involved in this new summer tradition. But yeah, congrats to Marie and Jillian on their picture book. All right. So our next book deal is Dial Press acquired North American rights to P. Paramita's debut novel, Appetite. 
The book is about the friendship forged between a 23-year-old Bangladeshi immigrant and a famous white wrestler and explores the dynamics of parasocial relationships, the blurred lines between public and private, the loneliness of young professional life, and the authentic connection shared by chosen family. And no publication date has been announced as of yet. Wrestling. I I was very surprised to find out that uh, wrestling has such a fervent such an ardent fan base um and it's kind of like it, it it's kind of fascinating to see like, how many people are into wrestling and did you how just a lot find of these, this out like recently well not not like like i like for for example like i follow giant bomb or i used to follow giant bomb and those guys love wrestling and i thought they were just like in the minority i was like oh these are just like uh, uh they're they're just like a small number of people who are like really into wrestling really follow like the personas that the wrestlers have and follow their career. But um, apparently it's, it's a lot of people. Uh, yeah, it's like a huge, <laughs> like I know I have friends my age who still follow wrestling and still talk about all the storylines. And it's basically like soap opera for, for, for men, but also <laughs> like not just guys are into it. Like it's, it's just good, dumb fun. And it's kind of interesting because like 23 year old is definitely still at that. Like for a lot of people, especially immigrants, I feel like it is kind of a, an entry point into American culture as well. Um, And in today's age of social media, you can definitely see how parasocial relationships can, can occur between um, fans and the people they're fans of. Like it's, it's no different than like, say, you know, stands of K-pop groups or, you know, Swifties, right? It's like that blurring of like your personal life and your online life and the communities that grow out of it, right? Like I know, Rira, you have your own group of like online friends that are into like your your K-pop faves, right? Yeah, not just like K-pop, but like I have friends who are really into like Doctor Who and, you know, like I have a group of friends who are really into Star Wars. I'm not really into that fandom, but like they're very dedicated cosplayers and, um, you know, like a lot of these friends I've gone to like conventions with, and like you said, it it's a community. It's a it's a chosen family, mm-hmm. uh, which I'm sure, um, which I'm sure like Paramita is gonna go into in in the book. And of course, I know a lot about parasocial relationships. Um, I <laughs> I mean, with the number of K-pop boy bands that I follow, and you know, kind of follow their Instagrams and all their live streams. Yeah, I, I know the Delulu-ness. So it will be very interesting to read about uh, Delulu-ness uh, in the wrestling world. Yeah, so congrats to um, P. Paramita on their debut. Um, okay, our next book deal. Pantheon Books acquired world rights for all countries except France to Blackbird by Eisner Award-winning graphic novelist Sunny Liu. Blackbird is the brilliant and tremendously ambitious story of a young cartoonist in Singapore who receives a job offer out of the blue to collaborate on a story with a reclusive billionaire named Quinn about a fictional Golden Age superhero whose story curiously overlaps with Quinn's own. Publication is set for 2026. So what I am, what I'm feeling from this uh, premise is that uh, pretty much Bruce Wayne hires a cartoonist to make batman and it's like huh a lot of lot of a lot of overlap (laughs) that's kind of what i'm getting yeah definitely like a meta take on the retiree hiring someone to um write their biography only this time it's in um graphic novel form right that's like such a old rich people thing to do you know it's just like ah yes someone to record my legacy and uh it's just like funny that it's it's coming from like a superhero vigilante angle. Yeah, so, I mean, if you're yeah. Batman, you need to set the record straight and have people remember you for the good things that you did, right? And not the um, not the more shady things that Batman does in the shadows. Yeah, but the thing is, like, you can't tell people that you're Batman, so it it's kind of like a weird thing where it's like, okay, like I'm a Batman sympathizer. Go make this con. <laughs> It's, yeah, yeah. It just so happens that my own parents were killed in an alleyway fifty years ago. No coincidence. It just so <laughs> happens that I have a like a, a car that is exactly the same as the Batmobile, and it just so happens that I have adopted a son um, <laughs> who is very interested in in Robin. I, like, yeah. 
I, th- I think it's a really fun premise. Uh, so yeah. congratulations to Sunny Liu. All right. So our next book deal is Holiday House acquired Serena Nanua's and Sasha Nanua's YA historical fantasy, A Riddle of Thorns, pitched as Divine Rivals meets The Inheritance Games. The book follows a girl who must compete against three strangers for her mother's mysterious inheritance, a plant set to have magical powers. Publication is planned for fall 2025. Yeah, so Serena and Sasha seem to be twin YA authors who, I guess, they're they're using their twin powers to form a a writing duel. Oh, that's pretty cool. Like, what are the chances that uh, your twin is also a writer? But this sounds fun. Uh, the Inheritance Games, like, I've heard, like, very fun things about it because um, it's, like, an eccentric grandfather figure who has, like, left an inheritance. Um to this girl and there's like puzzles and riddles and ciphers and I'm like oh that's like that's like really cool so if this book is being kind of pitched as um, a remix of that in a way um, it sounds cool plants said to have magical powers yeah love a good succession battle too I feel like there's not enough of that in today's like just more more of this especially if you're competing against snobby rich relatives I think that's that's fun to watch, right? Yeah, and it's a historical fantasy, so you know that like the stakes are a little bit higher because uh, it's us- it usually involves like I don't know death. <laughs> a lot of people die in historical fantasies, I and mean, there's like kingdoms to run and and whatnot. So yeah, um, yeah, this sounds really fun. Yeah, so congrats to Serena and Sasha on their on their book deal. All right, next up, Little Brown has bought world rights to A Village Made of Rainbows by debut author Joe Wu and illustrated by Alina Chow. Um, this picture book highlights war veteran Huang Yongfu, um, also known as Rainbow Grandpa, who transformed and saved his Taiwanese village with colorful art. Publication is planned for winter 2027. Yeah, I'm looking at the Google images and um, the murals are really beautiful, really, really vibrant and colorful. Um, it's really cool that you know, an entire village can just be made up of like these uh, really colorful murals. And um, Rainbow Grandpa is such a cute nickname. You know, I love grandpas who like do art because there's also like this grandpa that I follow on Instagram who like uh, does like watercolor and um, like draws uh, history, like Korean history for his uh, grandchildren. So yeah, it's I love a cool it. story to highlight, especially for for kids books. So um, looking forward to, you know, maybe next time we go back to Taiwan, I'll go visit the, the Rainbow Village and check it out myself. All right. So our next book deal is Simon & Schuster bought world rights to The Never-Ending Goodbye by Leila Bukharim and illustrated by Afsane Sine. Um, and the book is a humorous kid's eye view of what happens when you visit a Middle Eastern home. Publication is slated for spring 2026. Yeah, this is really interesting. I can't say that I'm that familiar with what a Middle Eastern home feels like, the the sights and smells and all that, you know? Yeah, I mean, just uh, gleaning from the title Never Ending Goodbye, I'm just thinking about how, as a kid, you're waiting for your parents to, like, finally say goodbye to the to the hosts at like a party but they're like not leaving and they continue to gab and it's like oh my god it's been an hour like when can we freaking leave and um i'm guessing like that kind of has to do with why the book is titled that way i don't know if that's like a thing in like chinese culture but i feel like in in especially like in korean and like filipino culture like that's that's what i've heard like people don't say it's like people tend to, you know, linger to gossip and they stay for a very long time. And it can be very annoying as <laughs> as an immigrant child. I feel like that's like every culture, though, even like young adult culture. Right. How many times have you called it a night at the bar only to stand outside the bar for hours on end gossiping? Yeah. Yeah. Right. I'm interested to see like what Middle Eastern home staples will be illustrated in the book. Yeah, looking forward uh, to Layla and Afsane to take us on that house tour. All right, our last book deal. Henry Holt has acquired North American rights to Upside Down Iftar by Mesa Ode and illustrated by Nadine Issa. This picture book follows a girl named Malik as her grandmother teaches her to make her family's favorite maklube for Iftar, the fast-breaking meal shared during Ramadan. But will her cooking satisfy her family of foodies? Publication is set for winter 2026. 
that is pretty stressful cooking for cooking for the first time for a family that is very particular about their food. Yeah, yeah. You would think that they would just be, you know, grateful that you made food and and took the time and effort. But I always have to say one comment. You know, it's like, oh, it's too salty, too sweet. Oh, you didn't like tenderize the meat enough or whatnot. I mean, I don't think that's what's going on here. I feel like anytime a kid cooks for you, you're like, this is really cool. Um, and that's, what it, that's what it feels like to have a supportive family, you know? Not everyone <laughs> gets that experience. Not everyone gets that experience when they cook for their family. And there's also something about like home cooked meals being like, I feel like you're more you're more forgiving when it's home cooked rather than restaurant cooked, right? Because you're not paying for you know, <laughs> you're not paying for the labor. Yeah, I mean, this is a sweet story with a grandmother and um, a little girl making like traditional food for their family. Yeah, so I'm sure I'm sure the family will be happy with whatever they get or else they'll have to answer the grandma, which you don't want to do. That's true. Grandma will grandma will hold up a wooden spoon and smack anyone <laughs> who talks smack about her granddaughter. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, congrats to Mesa and Nadine on their book deal. And with that um that'll do it for our publishing news for this month and moving on to our new segment uh, we do have a couple of really exciting um, news stories um for the first time i don't think we have any bummers this month so that's that's a good sign i mean um, there were some bummers uh in the publishing world like big bummers but uh, obviously we cover news of the asian american culture slash tangent so <laughs> yeah no no bummers this time around thankfully oh my yeah. gosh <laughs> You guys don't know the stress I go through when like an author that I like trends on Twitter and I'm like, oh my God, please, That's please true. don't yeah. be bad. There were a <laughs> Please couple, don't be canceled. <laughs> there were a couple bummers from like some pretty like high profile and beloved authors this past month. We're not going to go into it. Um, we can probably talk more about it. If you want to talk more about it, we can talk about it on Discord um, if you're a Patreon supporter. But yeah, yeesh. Anyways. Unhappier news, um, The Fortunes of Jaded Women um, by Carolyn Huynh, which is her debut novel about a family of Vietnamese American women, got optioned for a TV series, which is super exciting. Um, Fortunes of Jaded Women was a former Books and Boba book club pick and was definitely one of my favorite reads from last year and a book that I still recommend to anyone asking for like an Asian American or specifically a Vietnamese American uh, book rec. Yeah, and they also recruited Alan Yang, uh, who is behind Master of None, Parks and Recreation, and The Good Place. And uh, Huynh is actually going to be writing the script with Becca Brunstetter. It's really rare for the author to also, like, be a part of, like, the script writing process. Because sometimes they want, like, the author to be removed from it so that they can, like, create their own adaptation. But I think this is a very good sign. I think it's a good call. I feel like the project I've seen where the author was removed from process, I ended up not entirely enjoying what came out of it. I think having the author's voice, because that's what, especially for books that I've read personally, I think that's, you know, the excitement of seeing an adaptation is to see the author's voice be brought to life. And without the author there, it's not the same, right? Yeah. And I I will mention, like, it's really interesting that you say that, Marvin, because, uh, like, I feel like when we first started this podcast, you were so used to watching like the adaptation and not reading the source material. But now, like as more Asian books have been like picked up or uh, we've been reading more books lately, um, it's it's just you're 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 a team book now. You're just like, yeah. I mean, it's like, also due to the fact that when we started this podcast, I had not read a book for fun in like decades. So at this point, especially for TV and movies that are based on books written by Asians, chances are I probably have read that already. That being said, I we still haven't read Interior Chinatown, which is coming out in November. They just dropped a trailer for that TV series as well. So um, there's yeah, one um, that and, I have not read the book yet. <laughs> yeah, and season two of Pachinko is coming out next month as well. So, um, Well, that one I have read the book for. and Yeah, yeah. exactly. I mean, we... <laughs> It, it's just, and also like the sympathizer like i haven't watched the sympathizer yet but you know it got a lot of like good praise from critics that was a good so adaptation it's like, i enjoyed the sympathizer yeah i mean we we can share more of uh your thoughts on a patreon episode because i i have not watched it um and i would just love to hear your thoughts like more extensively 
Um, okay, so our second piece of news is that the shortlist for the 2024 Ursula K. Le Guin Prize for Fiction has been announced, um, and it is a writing competition that honors a book-length work of imaginative fiction. The prize is for $25,000, and the award is intended to recognize writers who Ursula spoke of in her 2014 National Book Award speech, realists of a larger reality who can imagine real grounds for hope and see alternatives to how we live now. Um, so 10 books were chosen on the shortlist uh, by the Ursula K. Le Guin Foundation, and um, it was chosen by a panel of judges, including Margaret Atwood, Omar el Megan Giddings, Ken Liu, and Carmen Maria Machado. And um, the winner will be announced on October 21st on Le Guin's birthday. Um, so there were a number of um, authors of Asian descent that made it to the shortlist, and we're just going to go quickly through them. So we have The Saint of Bright Doors by Vajra Chandra Sekhera, and it is a book that follows Fetter, a young man with the ability to see devils, demons, and magic as he rejects his chosen one upbringing and discovers a much stranger life in a city full of doors and powers. Um, we also have The Skin and Its Girl by Sarah Seifer. The book follows a queer, blue-skinned Palestinian-American woman as she pieces together her late great-aunt's secrets and ponders the next stage of her life and how it is informed by her family's past. Uh, we also have The Siege of Burning Grass by Primi Mohammed, and it is set in a world where two empires are long divided by conflict and follows a famed pacifist who is coerced into a mission of war alongside a zealot who cares only for victory. And finally, we have Mammoths at the Gates by Ni Vo. The book follows a wandering story collecting cleric who returns home for the first time in almost three years to find their abbey's leader has died. Problems arise when the leader's distant family demands his body, despite it already being interred in the manner of respected clerics. So congratulations to all of the shortlist uh, nominees, but especially the nominees of Asian descent. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool that we have this award that recognizes authors who write speculative fiction, but with like a hopeful lens. I think a lot of times, you know, I feel like we're in a very, we're back in a very dystopia heavy cycle in speculative fiction where a lot of the things that are coming out are all about how everything sucks. Um, but it's part of the joy in creating speculative fiction is to imagine the world as it could be, right? So it's kind of cool that uh, we have this award that recognizes those, those efforts. Yeah, I mean, we live in a dystopia. So really, we don't need to imagine how much worse it can get. So it's really cool that we have speculative fiction, like you said, that is more hopeful and also presents an alternative reality where, um, you know, like stories that we haven't really seen before in the genre. Yeah. Okay, so our last piece of news is that the New York Times announced their best 100 books of the century. And um, I'm not sure how they selected these books. I'm guessing that like the New York Times staff picked them. Um, but we do have a couple of Asian authors who made the list. I'm uh, going to quickly go through them. At number 90, we have The Sympathizer by Viet Thuyen Nguyen. And we've read The Sympathizer for our book club before. You guys can listen to our in-depth discussion. Um, it was one of our earlier book club picks. I think it was like within our first year. Um, and then at number 84, we have The Emperor of All Maladies by Siddhartha Mukherjee. And number 76, Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin. Um, at number 75, we have Exit West by Mosin Hamid. And we read Exit West for book club. Um, I think it was it was also like a pretty, pretty early pick. Um, but it was a very slim book. So we got through it like pretty quickly, I remember. Um, at 58, we have Stay True by Hua Su. And this is a pretty recent book. It came out in 2022 and it's a memoir. So it was actually pretty surprising to see like a like a more contemporary book, making it to like a list of best books of the century. Uh, at number 49, we have The Vegetarian by Han Kang. 
and it is um, a translated book. Um, at number 48, we have Persepolis by uh, Marjan Satrapi, which is uh, which is a graphic novel. So it's really nice to see a graphic novel making it onto this um, prestigious list. At number 15, we have Pachinko by Min Jin Lee, which, you know, we've talked about many, many times on this podcast. And I'm not surprised that it made it onto the list as like a new classic. And then at number nine, we have Never Let Me Go by Kazuo Ishiguro, um, which was another book club pick. But yeah, like a fair number of book club picks made it onto this list. Yeah, I mean, what can I say? We we read good books on this podcast. I feel like there's a surprising lack of book club picks on this list, though. I feel like we should have more on here, personally speaking. Yeah, I mean, like, best books of... I mean, I I have to, like, look at the full list again. But a century is a very long time. So I wonder, like, what their criteria was when they were I mean, according them. to the New York Times, it was voted on by 503 novelists, nonfiction writers, poets, critics, and other book lovers with a little help from the staff of the New York Times Book Review. So, oh, okay, interesting. All like right, a pure kind of academy style of ranking. Um, who knows how much the staff of New York Times put their thumb on the scale? Um, but it's kind of cool that you know these lists are always cool. But at the same time, I'm always skeptical of of lists as well. I mean, but if it, it feels like more democratic this time around, considering that they like have like a larger number of people. Not voting, but I guess like nominating for for books they want on this list. I mean, also, it looks like it's all books written since 2000, January 1st, 2000. So that's why. Oh, okay. So it's like best books of the 21st century. Yeah. Got it. Got it. All right. Yeah. That would make sense. All right. All right. I cannot believe. Like, so technically, it's the best books of the last 24 years, which does reduce the, the eligible books by. A huge margin, right? Yeah, interesting. Okay, okay, yeah. Uh, is there a book that you think should be on this list? Babel, Yellowface, Jade City. I mean, even yeah. I mean, I think I if think we're going to talk about like picks. epic family drama, um, Fortunes of Jaded Women, I think should be on this list, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm really pleased that Never Let Me Go made it onto this list because I will say it's probably one of my more, um, it, it's probably one of my favorite reads that we've had on this podcast. And um, it was really fun talking to Marvin about that book because I made him go into it completely cold. And uh, it was really fun too, to hear I mean, his reaction. It makes sense too because that's a book that is, you know, a lot of the books that we read are written maybe not with Asian Americans in mind, but definitely with a Asian American lens. And that book was definitely more like, you know, general audience, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't want to say general audience, but yeah, it wasn't about Asian American identity. It wasn't about uh, the immigrant struggle. But uh, Pachinko, not a surprise at all. I feel like this is a book that schools, I mean, if they don't ban books, but... Um, schools will probably read and analyze as, you know, part of their English class. Yeah, I mean, I feel like a lot of the books on this list are, I mean, they're definitely books that broke through. And, you know, like Pachinko was a hit, Sympathizer. They're, they're all f- novels that broke out of, like, even our bubble into the general, like, they're all universally beloved, right? So it does make sense that they'll make it on this list because, uh, you know, to make it through a academy style voting block, you need to be a book that everyone has heard of. Yeah. Although I'm sure if I look at the list more carefully, there's going to be a lot of books that I've never heard of, um, such as the nature of the literary world. Um, not every single book gets the marketing push that they deserve. So, yeah. But yeah, it's always cool to see um Asian authors on lists like these, especially Asian authors that we featured on our book club. It's also good to know, you know, which books we should add to our future book club pick list um, now that they've entered the canon as the best books of the past 24 years. Let's be honest. This is the books of the century is a big misleading misnomer. Yeah, it really, it really is. I thought it was, true. I, I thought it was literally going to be books that were published in the last hundred years, but just the 21st century. Got us again, New York Times. Yeah. But yeah, congrats to all the authors who got recognized 
uh, regardless. Um, and with that, that'll do it for our mid-month episode uh, for July 2024. Thank you so much for joining us as we went through the latest Asian American book and publishing news. And before we go, um, Reba, can you remind us what we are reading this month for Book Club? Yeah, we are reading The Sense of Wonder by Matthew Salasis. And this is a patron pick from our Honey Boba members. And it is a book about Asian Americans in sports. And there's also a K-drama storyline in there. I have not started reading it. So obviously, like, I don't have much to say. But Marvin, <laughs> you started reading it. Yeah. Like, so what, are, I, what are your thoughts so far? Yeah. You know, I've been reading along with our Patreon members on Discord. And it's been it's been a fun ride so far. It's kind of the first chapter. It definitely reads... Sort of like, so it's based on the Jeremy Lin, Lin Sanity era, only with the main character being a Korean American. Um, so it kind of, it kind of feels like a AU fanfic of sorts of Lin Sanity starring a Korean man. Um, but I really love their, like, who, uh, Matthew, Matthew Salasis definitely has hung out in Asian American circles in the late aughts, early 2010s, because he definitely captures the vibe of like existing in the community where everyone's trying to, um, pursue representation um, and it's still a little bit out of reach. Right? We're, we're still a little bit before um, 2018 and the whole crazy Asians fever. And so it's like, it's a really interesting time um, for, especially for Asian Americans who finally got a glimpse of what it feels like to be seen in mainstream culture. And I think he captures that really well. So for me, it's been really fun to kind of revisit this time um, that I recognize from own personal experience. And Reba, you've, you were active during this time too in the Asian American community. So I'm sure you will find a lot of things that will um, personally speak to you as well. Oh, interesting. Okay. So yeah, read along with us. Um, if you have finished the book and have thoughts to share, uh, please let us know either on Discord or on our Goodreads forums. Um, as always, we'd love to include your feedback on our discussion episodes whenever possible. So um, definitely get um, get in on the conversation. But with that, that'll do it for this episode of Books and Boba. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you all next time. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for listening to Books and Boba. This podcast was hosted by Marvin Yue and Ri Ryu and edited and produced by Marvin Yue. Follow the book club on Twitter and Instagram by going to at Books and Boba and engage with us on Goodreads on our Goodreads group. You can also check out past episodes of the podcast by going to booksandboba.com and by subscribing to us on your favorite podcast app. Don't forget, you can support Books and Boba and Asian American authors by purchasing books at our bookshop.org account. Check out the link in our show notes and also at booksandboba.com. Books and Boba is a proud member of the Potluck Podcast Collective, a collective of Asian American hosted podcasts featuring unique voices and stories from the Asian diaspora. Learn more about the collective and check out our fellow Potluck shows by visiting the website podcastpotluck.com. Thanks for listening. gets a little crazy sometimes. Sometimes it's confusing, sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's beautiful, and sometimes it can just piss us off. Enter First of All Podcast. It's a safe space for real conversations about the things that we all struggle with, celebrate, contemplate, and work through in our daily lives. I'm your host, Mindy Chang. I'm an actor, filmmaker, and entrepreneur with a colorful background, a full life, and brilliant friends who I love to unpack life with to share with all of you. They are everyday people like you and me, ranging from award-winning artists, cultural icons, powerful CEOs, my hilarious childhood friends, and even my mom. Tune in for honest conversations on mental health, dating, sex, family, career, culture, and everything in between. Listen to First of All wherever you find podcasts. Part of the Potluck Podcast Collective.